Now we'll talk about class 3 antiarrhythmics, which are the potassium channel blockers. And again, potassium channel blockers work uh, by prolonging the action potential duration. So recall that phase 3 of the action potential is mediated by the potassium channels. So when you block uh, potassium channels, you block phase 3 of the action potential, and it takes longer for the cell to repolarize. So potassium channel blockers work by prolonging the action potential duration. Probably the most important drug in class 3 is amiodarone. Amiodarone is a drug in, um, that is classified as a class 3 antiarrhythmics, but actually also has very potent class 1, class 2, and class 4 effects. Um, maybe this is why it's highly effective for a wide variety of rhythm disturbances. Uh, but it's also very toxic. Uh, and the three major toxicities that you have to know about is the capability of amiodarone to cause thyroid dysfunction, either hypo or hyperthyroidism, in part mediated by the existence of iodine molecules on the drug. Amiodarone can cause pulmonary fibrosis, and amiodarone can cause liver toxicity. So the clinical kind of rule of thumb is that every year, if you have a patient on amiodarone, you want to check TFTs, thyroid function tests, uh, PFTs, uh, pulmonary function tests, and LFTs, liver function tests. The other thing you can see with amiodarone is a bluish uh, skin discoloration that's very characteristic. Because of its um, antiarrhythmic effects, you can get uh, bradycardia or heart block, probably mediated by its class 2 and class 4 effects. And because it's a class 3 antiarrhythmic, uh, by definition, uh, it prolongs action potential duration and therefore prolongs the QT interval. However, torsade is very rare. The other class 3 antiarrhythmics to know about are sodalol, dofetilide, and ibutilide. Um, and these are pretty similar, but uh, shown here on this slide are a couple of distinctions among them. So sodalol, as you can tell by the OL at the, OL at the end of the name, also has beta blocking effects. Sotalol and dofetilide are PO medications, whereas ibutilide is an IV medication. And um, all three of these drugs can prolong the QT interval and can cause uh, torsade by doing that. Dofetilide, important to know, is uh, a drug that requires renal dose adjustment. So those were the class 3 antiarrhythmics, and now let's talk about the class 4 antiarrhythmics, the calcium channel blockers. So calcium channel blockers work um, by prolonging phase 4 in the AV node and the SA node. And I think the details of, of that aren't uh, completely important. Just know that calcium channel blockers slow down um, nodal tissue activation. And it also can increase the action potential duration. So uh, not all calcium channel blockers that you learn about, specifically amlodipine, uh, which you may learn about in your hypertension block, um, act in the heart. So the ones to know about are verapamil and diltiazem. Uh, these are the calcium channel blockers we're talking about when we're talking about uh, calcium channel blockers as antiarrhythmic drugs. Important side effects of, of calcium channel blockers are constipation and peripheral edema. Um, you can also have uh, proarrhythmic effects uh, mediated by its effect on uh, blocking uh, conduction, you can get sinus bradycardia and heart block. And so the, the, these drugs are uh, contraindicated in advanced heart failure and in heart block. Okay, two more non-classified drugs to talk about that are really important in treating rhythm disturbances. The first is adenosine, which is a nucleoside, just like adenosine is found as part of your DNA. And this is a really important uh, signaling molecule. There are adenosine receptors all over the body that mediate a lot of different functions. One of those functions is to lead to potassium channel activation. And if you have potassium channel activation, if you increase conductance to potassium channel, you make the membrane hyperpolarized. You make it harder for an action potential um, to occur. You make it harder for the cell to reach threshold. And so what you get with this is a transient elective heart block. Now you might be wondering why you would ever want to do that, but it's actually very useful, as we'll see in class, to um, dissect out um, some 
some uh, supraventricular arrhythmias so you can figure out what the exact cause of it was. So that's adenosine. This is digoxin. And digoxin you'll learn about further um, when you uh, learn about medications useful in heart failure. Um, but suffice it to say that digoxin has two broad classes of how it works. One is its direct membrane effects by its inhibition of the sodium potassium exchanger. This leads to its inotropic effects that make this uh, drug useful in some types of heart failure. And digoxin has vag vagomimetic effects. So um, through a separate, separate mechanism, it acts as if um, vagus nerve stimulation is occurring. And the vagomimetic effects are largely what are responsible for its electrophysiologic effects. Now, importantly, digoxin is a drug with a narrow therapeutic window. And when you get too much digoxin in your body, you get uh, electrophysiologic side effects um, at these toxic doses, which are largely mem uh, mediated by its direct membrane effects on the sodium cha channel, rather sodium potassium exchanger. But the electrophysiologic effects are through the, the vagomimetic aspects of digoxin function. And the way digoxin is useful is it slows the sinus rate and prolongs AV node refractoriness, uh, just like the vagus nerve does. So again, digoxin is a drug with a really narrow therapeutic window. To give you an idea, blood levels need to be between about 0.7 or let's say 0.6 and 0.9, I think nanograms per mil for it to have the proper therapeutic effect. Um, digoxin in overdose can lead to nausea, diarrhea, and yellow vision. Um, Prorhythmic effects can really be almost anything, and the treatment of severe toxicity is with anti-digoxin um, monoclonal antibody fragments. So we covered this Vaughn Williams classification. We talked about class one drugs subdivided into 1A, 1B, and 1C, class two drugs, which are the beta blockers, class three drugs, which are the potassium channel blockers, class four drugs, which are the calcium channel blockers, and two non-classified drugs, adenosine and digoxin. So putting it all together, and uh, how do we use these different drugs in the different arrhythmias that we talked about, and how are these um, drugs useful? We, rec we covered mostly the side effects of these drugs because those side effects are sort of specific to each individual drug, but we can sort of lump together how the drugs um, work by class, more or less. Now, um, this is this is a difficult topic, but that's the purpose of sort of reinforcing it in class. So we'll just go through now uh, in wrapping up the sort of broad framework, and we'll get through some of the details a little bit more in class. So we talked about how antiarrhythmic drugs can be used to disrupt AVNRT and AVRT. These are good indications for using antiarrhythmic drugs. And the way that this works is by really trying to interrupt conduction through the AV node, because the AV node is highly susceptible to a couple of these drug classes. And so acutely, if you want to either terminate the rhythm or diagnose the rhythm, you can use adenosine because it's very rapidly acting. You give the drug, it lasts about six or eight seconds, and you get this transient elective heart block. Chronically, if you're trying to manage this condition and uh, sort of slow down uh, conduction through the AV node, or the um, or AVRT, you can use beta blockers, uh, calcium channel blockers, or digoxin. So the second big sort of umbrella of, of um, rhythm disturbances that are amenable to antiarrhythmic drug therapy are atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. Uh, these are sort of two related um, atrial arrhythmias um, that both can be uh, treated with a rate control strategy, potentially. Now, it's important to note that atrial fibrillation is much easier to rate control than atrial flutter, which is sort of notorious to be very difficult to rate control, but you can, in some cases, do it. And so the drugs that are useful for rate control are, again, the drugs that uh, block conduction through the AV node, beta blockers, uh, calcium channel blockers, and digoxin. Now, if you're going to try to adopt a rhythm control strategy for atrial fibrillation, 
um, an atrial flutter. And again, atrial flutter isn't as amenable to rhythm control as atrial fibrillation is. Uh, atrial flutter is really sort of uh, best treated through ablation, um, which is an electrophysiologic procedure, but you can try rhythm control. Um, the best drugs to use are class 1C agents and class 3 agents because class 1C agents probably interfere uh, with reentry. Remember, these are um, reentrant arrhythmias by slowing conduction. Class 3 agents uh, probably interfere with reentry by prolonging repolarization. So both of those maneuvers can um, sort of end the reentry. And sort of the third umbrella is uh, suppressing ventricular tachycardia and sym symptomatic uh, premature ventricular contractions. Uh, class two agents, beta blockers, are really um, important in this because they can uh, slow conduction in the sick tissue. Uh, class three agents can also be useful, sotalol and particularly amiodarone, uh, because again, they can re interfere with reentry by prolonging repolarization. And class one B agents uh, can be useful in uh, ventricular tachycardia because of interference with reentry by slowing conduction. And we won't really talk about class one agents. Now I mentioned a special case of ventricular tachycardia in the setting of myocardial infarction. And uh, class two agents like beta blockers, again, are useful. Class three agents, uh, in particular amiodarone, I just wanna highlight, uh, is very useful. And again, class one B agents. Now the real distinction comes in the case of torsade de point, um, where we again are trying to sort of treat the underlying milieu because they occur. It occurs because of early after depolarizations, and some of the drugs that sort of help treat um, the uh, electrophysiological milieu are magnesium, phenytoin, um, isoproteranol, and overdrive pacing. But like all forms of sort of active VT, the best therapy in the acute setting is shot. So thank you. I hope these webcasts were informative and uh, that they lay the groundwork for our discussion in class.